You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of uh, Collected Works number 266, volume 1 of three volumes, entitled From the Esoteric School, Esoteric Lessons, 1904 to 1909, by Rudolf Steiner, translated by James H. Hines. This is section 18. Some of these esoteric lessons are very short, so I'm compiling a few in each reading. And this is, uh, you know, this section 18 is the beginning of the esoteric lessons from 1909. Esoteric lesson given in Munich on January 7th, 1909. Record A, manuscript from Amelie Fugerglut and Anonymous. Record B, manuscript from Alice Kinkel. Record A. It is necessary that we constantly bear in mind that in an esoteric lesson, things are told to us directly from a supersensible world that those who speak to us are to be regarded as instruments that are used by the masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings. Those who listen with this in mind will receive the pronouncements in the proper frame of mind. In this lesson, we will speak mostly of two things. Either we deepen ourselves in the way we should be doing our meditations, or we discuss the attitudes that we develop in ourselves that we should cultivate with respect to our daily life, our fellow human beings, attitudes that are absolutely necessary if we wish to become true esotericists. We should also approach our meditations with a certain attitude, and concerning this attitude we wish to speak today. Every single meditation has been brought to us through the millennia by the great initiates. These meditations are the path into the spiritual world. Each one of them gives us, if only in a weak reflection, an image of initiation. They are an image of what will one day happen to us, though, as stated, only in a very weak reflection. In order for a meditation to work in and upon us in the right way, we should imagine the meditative material in as pictorial a way as possible, in a spiritual picture that we create ourselves. For example, if we are given the meditation, in pure rays of light shines the divinity of the world, then we should imagine shining rays of light or a great luminous moon. In this moment, we should try to shed everything that ties us to the sense world. We should try to give ourselves to the picture As much as possible, we should try to live in it. We should seek to penetrate entirely into the meaning of the material. Meditation should be for us the most important sacred undertaking of our day. When we immerse ourselves in these pictures as deeply as possible, when we allow them into us, then according to how intensely and earnestly we participate, And according to how our karma leads us, one sooner, another perhaps only after years, we will experience a moment during meditation in which we notice that these pictures, these imaginations, are realities, that they are a world in which we suddenly find ourselves, and indeed not as onlookers from outside, but rather in the middle of these things. Of course, we will then live still in the outer world, and yet entirely differently than usual. For the world that was opened to us is entirely different. We are located, so to speak, on the other side of things. Now there are two things to consider that we now want to discuss. One concerns those who have not yet penetrated to clairvoyant vision. The other concerns those who have reached the state of imagination. The former, as you have all experienced, are downright attacked the moment they begin their meditation by thoughts concerned with their surroundings, their daily life, the outer world. 
All noises are experienced as more disturbing. All thoughts and pictures that do not belong are more penetrating. Battling against them would not help at all, for behind these thoughts stand powers. It would be as if someone in the middle of a swarm of bees were to begin swinging his or her hands, trying to strike them in order to protect him or herself. The bees would attack this person with twice the might. Now, we have an esoteric means of proceeding against these undesired thoughts, of bringing them to silence. Indeed, this means is the same for those we have just mentioned as it is for the disturbances suffered by those who have already achieved vision. We imagine, as clearly as possible, the staff of Mercury, a luminous staff around which a black snake is wound, and then we imagine a bright snake that is entwined around the other one. The black snake symbolizes the materialistic thoughts that disturb us, the lower self. The bright snake represents divine thoughts, the higher self. And when we place this symbol in which the bright snake is entwined against the dark snake in all its significance, then all disturbances will disappear and we can immerse ourselves in meditation. Those who have attained to clairvoyant vision will be disturbed in their visions by the same forces that in others unleash the everyday thoughts. They will see all possible passions, desires and so forth which live in the astral world in the form of wild, often ugly, sometimes also seductively beautiful animals. Here too the imagined staff of Mercury, the messenger of the gods, is the only solution. If we devote ourselves entirely to our meditations, then we will experience, according to our karma, one person sooner, another later, a certain feeling. We will feel as if our I, capital, were lost, as if we were split, inwardly torn apart. We must have this feeling. It is entirely correct, up to a certain point. We humans feel ourselves enclosed in our bodies as a unity, but we must consider that we are something very complicated, assembled, that the world of the spirit, which for the most part we belong to, is definitely not something simple. On Saturn, the thrones worked on our physical body. On the sun, from another aspect, the spirits of wisdom worked on our etheric body. On the moon, again, from another aspect, the spirits of movement worked on our astral body. And again, in a certain way on earth, the spirits of form have worked on our eye. All possible lofty spiritual beings still worked on our physical body, on the sun and the moon. Others, for example, formed our larynx. Again, others, the heart or the liver. The reproductive organs were created by different beings than those who created our digestive apparatus. Now at a certain stage of development, meditants feel as if they were being divided up among all these powers, as if they were handed over to them, as if they were lost among them. Those who have not yet achieved vision will then have a feeling of nothing, as if the meditations were bringing them no fruits at all. This feeling is very depressing, but it contains no great danger neither for the meditant nor for meditation in and of itself. Seers in this state will hear a voice, the voice of a figure that they will soon see, and this figure will whisper to them that the world that they see is nothing, only the creation of their own illusions. That is the temptation that approaches them from the side that wants to hold humans back with all possible power in the sense world, in matter, that does not want to let them ascend into the spiritual world. And this temptation is a great danger. Here, too, an esoteric solution is given to us. At the end of every meditation, we imagine the rose cross. The rose cross is a symbol for the mystery of Golgotha. The cross, the symbol of death, from which roses 
the symbol of life, sprout with the blood that flowed from the wounds. If we place this symbol with all its significance before the soul, we will have an unconquerable weapon for use against the power that leads us into temptation. And why? Because Christ, through his death, in the moment when his blood flowed, was united with the astral body of the earth and brought it new life and light. In this astral body he lives as the astral light that shines in the darkness. When we have achieved vision, we see into this astral light. The rose cross is therefore the symbol for the light that conquers the powers of darkness. We see physical objects with our physical eyes because they are dark and for this reason reflect sunlight outwardly. However, when we attain vision through our meditations, then the dark sheath that covers the objects will become thinner and thinner. We will see the astral light in them shine forth, the light in the darkness, and they will thereby reveal to us their inner being. We will recognize the forces at work in everything. We will live with them. For example, let us think of a red crystal cube, such as nature often produces. We will not only see this cube from outside, but also feel the forces in it, the forces that formed it, that spread over its surface another light opposite to the red. Anyone who wanted to penetrate into the inner being of this crystal by striking it would create nothing but more externalities. We penetrate into the inside only by looking into the astral light. In order to be able to endure this astral light breaking in, in earlier times in pre-Christian initiation, the person to be initiated had to go through a kind of sleep of death, which happened during the three days that they lay in the grave. Someone who had to go through this preparation after the event of Golgotha was Paul, who lay for three days in torpor after he had seen the astral light. When they are done properly, our meditations should leave us a spiritual strengthening. But if you do not feel this strengthening, do not fear it, that it did not happen. We often have no feeling for it. However, every meditation has its effects sooner or later and often after years we harvest fruits that we had not expected. Those who, so to speak, are patiently satisfied with little, who do not demand growth with greed and impatience, will always receive a spiritual strengthening. The end of Record A. Record B. When pupils have time, they can do these exercises. They must be careful that their physical body does not interfere with the meditation. At the beginning, it is not necessary to be completely vegetarian. Meditants can freely eat whatever is good for their body. However, they should not eat food that has a tendency to condense or move toward the center of the earth, but only that which does not hinder spiritualization. Great inner moderation is the best guide for this. They must be careful to have the right amount of nutrient salts in their meals, but anything that leaves a sediment behind should be avoided. They should also not eat anything that grows within the earth. It is good to avoid meat, but milk or anything coming from it may be eaten. Legumes pollute dreams. Everything depends mainly on having the right attitude in doing all that is done. In our efforts, it is a matter of taking up an esoteric stream that strives for harmony. That is the end of that esoteric lesson. The next esoteric lesson was given in Munich on January 11, 1909, manuscript from Matilda Scholl, and there is a complicated diagram to begin with. Not all the senses have the same value. They have opened the physical plane for us, but the sense of touch is not bound to these alone. 
It shows us or lets us perceive not only the surface, soft, hard, rough, pointed, but also warmth. Humans were originally a body of warmth. The warmth, the fire, remained in them. In early Lemurian times, there were no surfaces. The soul of the human being penetrated things. Because of the Luciferic influence, these were closed off behind a surface. The, quote, gate of the earth, close quote, was closed. The human being, or better the human soul, in early Lemurian times, still saw the astral light that was behind the warmth when sensing warmth. The, quote, gate of fire, close quote, stood open. It was closed as the gate of earth was formed. Earth and fire are related to one another in the esoteric sense as air and water. The power of the relationship between air and water is related to the germinal forces which the Atlanteans had mastery over. We access these forces again by means of the relationships that fire has with air and the earth with water, the former with breath exercises the latter through certain meditations that have an effect on the earthly brain. Because of the Luciferic influence, humans were enclosed in the earthly physical sheath earlier than would have occurred if the other powers alone had influenced the human being. Fire, physical and mineral also, should have been taken away from them. Lucifer gave it to humankind. The Greeks and the ancient Nordic peoples understood this and expressed it in the myths of Prometheus and Loki. The human being will learn to master fire only on Vulcan and thereby become creative. That's the end of that esoteric lesson. The next esoteric lesson was given in Kassel on February 26, 1909. Notes from the collection of Fred Pepic Today we want to consider some difficulties that are typical for meditants. Meditation is, in small measure, of course, the same as what initiation is on a large scale. Also in meditation, certain difficulties appear and therefore must be overcome immediately at the start. As soon as pupils enter an esoteric path, powers who seek to hinder their development come to meet them. Such powers are constantly present. However, an esoteric pupil is more valuable for these powers than someone whose interest is turned only toward the external things of the physical world. For what, then, is it essential to strive in meditation? We should forget ourselves by extinguishing everything connected with ordinary life in order to immerse ourselves only in the content of the prescribed words, so that we no longer know or feel anything concerning our body or concerning thoughts and feelings of daily life. But the adversary powers want to prevent us from doing precisely this. They try to draw us back into everyday life by hindering our concentration on thoughts. As soon as we notice this, For example, in the meditation, quote, in pure rays of light, close quote, in which we are not supposed to think or feel anything other than that light is the garment of God, so that we live entirely in this picture, we can imagine the staff of Mercury as an effective symbol. Indeed, we imagine it as a luminous bright yellow staff entwined by two snakes, one dark and one a luminous white snake. We begin with the dark snake. All living things are found in a skin, which is a sign that they are enclosed in the physical world. The etheric body also has a skin, so too the astral body. When humans receive the impressions of the day through their senses, these impressions have an effect on the skin of their astral body. It is pushed back and used up. It gets tears and fissures. 
This, that is seen in fatigue. This skin is torn apart when we fall asleep and is renewed during sleep. Now, we should attempt to become conscious of this process before falling asleep. In doing this, we can imagine how we are now entering spiritual worlds where the astral body is again renewed by spiritual beings in the realm of harmonies and music of the spheres. We should fall asleep with a feeling of gratitude toward these divine beings and powers. In doing so, we should feel a love for wisdom. Then, baleful influences will not be able to reach us. Now, just as humans use up the skin of their soul bodies in the course of 24 hours and then renew it, so too a snake casts off its skin in certain rhythms, leaves it behind, and renews it again. For this reason, spiritually, beholding the staff of Mercury is an effective means for overcoming the influences that hinder us from penetrating spiritual worlds in meditation. Another method lies in imagining that we feel ourselves as if enclosed in a blue aura and thereby protected from all evil thoughts and feelings that want to attack us from outside. We inwardly feel how we are closed off from all evil influences by this aura. Only good powers can find entry into our soul. This can be effectively connected with the following meditation. Meditation for Protection Against Outer Influences Quote, May the outer sheath of my aura grow stronger. May it surround me with an impenetrable vessel against all impure, self-seeking thoughts and feelings. May it be opened only to divine wisdom. Close quote. Now, it is like this. A beginner at first feels only the presence of powers in his or her distracted thoughts, while an advanced pupil sees these astral powers as parasitic animals, as rats and mice. But no one who sees the rats and mice should be delighted about the fact that he or she is already so advanced. Otherwise, he or she would be completely subject to these powers. We must make ourselves strong to resist the influence of these dark powers. There is a second typical experience that appears in meditation. Again, the beginner feels it while the advanced see it. We feel as if our physical body no longer belongs to us, as if we were divided in pieces in the universe. Even the organs, such as the heart, the liver, gallbladder, are expanded. And we remind ourselves that our physical body has come into existence on Saturn through the in-streaming of the substance of the thrones, our etheric body on old sun through the spirits of wisdom, our astral body on old moon, through the spirits of movement, while our eye was given to us on earth by the spirits of form. We return to these spirits in meditation. Now we should not imagine that each of these individual organs returns to the powers that implanted them in the human being during the cosmic evolution of the world. It is much more a feeling of belonging to those powers, a rising in one's feelings to their moods, during which the consciousness of our own I must constantly remain when we feel this sense of belonging to the corresponding spiritual powers. A further typical experience during meditation is the feeling that one's consciousness is weakened, indeed that it is dampened down. In a certain regard, this is also the case. Nevertheless, we must attempt to remain constantly awake. A means of doing this is to visualize the black cross with seven red roses. It is the great symbol of Christ Jesus himself, the rose cross, life dying, passing away, which has within itself the power to bring forth new life out of itself. Altogether, the spiritual beholding of this symbol always has a strengthening effect on spiritual development, 
It strengthens our everyday life in all situations. Indeed, the tempter approaches us most powerfully during our esoteric exercises. Advanced pupils see it in pictures as it is given in the Bible. This picture is drawn precisely. Finally, during meditation, a feeling of deepest peace clearly enters. It is not any external feeling of calm, but rather a deep inner feeling of peace that cannot be disturbed by anything, no matter how much roaring and tumult may rage around us. These are the three typical phenomena during meditation, along with many others, which vary according to the individuality of the meditant. Number one, bewitching phenomena, parasitic animals. Number two, distribution of oneself among the various hierarchies, during which we are not allowed to lose our I consciousness. Number three, the deepest soul peace is imparted to us. The staff of Mercury helps us to penetrate into spiritual worlds. The Rose Cross strengthens us in doing so. There are two things we should try to avoid entirely during our esoteric training. We should never injure another, never through deed, nor in thought or word. Furthermore, we should not try to employ the excuse that we did not intend to injure someone. It does not matter whether we did it with intention or not. The other feeling, excuse me, the other thing is the feeling of hate, which must disappear entirely. Otherwise it will reappear in the feeling of fear, for fear is suppressed hate. We must transform hate into a feeling of love, the love of wisdom. That's the end of that esoteric lesson. The next esoteric lesson was given in Berlin on March 3rd, 1909. Record A, manuscript from Nelly Lichtenberg. Record B, manuscript from Camilla Vandri. Record A. In our meditations, we should have the attitude that we have spiritual powers around us and that we devote ourselves to them. For all those who belong to a true esoteric training stand under the leadership of the masters of wisdom and the harmony of feeling. In the moments of meditation, we should completely loosen ourselves from the events of the day, altogether from the physical world. And we achieve through contemplation or inner immersion, if we are in a position to do so, the ability to fill our soul with content. We should then create the content ourselves. What the teacher gives should be seen as a seed. He or she speaks objectively about higher worlds, and we should feel it in meditation and bring what has been related to us to life. The teacher will never want to reach into the eye of another. Altogether, no one should ever reach into the eye of another. Now, during meditation, there are certain temptations that pupils must overcome. And for that purpose, the following two symbols should be placed before the soul as helping supports when they fall to these temptations. If pupils, still at the beginning of their training, are still thinking of the events of the day during meditation, or if their surroundings distract them from concentration, then they should place the caduceus before their soul, this ancient symbol, the luminous staff with the dark snake and the bright snake. What does this symbol represent? All living beings, down to the simplest life forms, are enclosed in a skin. So too, visible for a clairvoyant, our astral body is enclosed in a skin during the wakefulness of the day. However, the skin is frayed and torn as its forces are used up. And when the astral body is properly frayed and torn, then sleep enters for the human being. When we then return to the spiritual world during sleep, this skin is restored. For this reason, every evening, we should remember that we are returning to the spiritual world, our home. The Pythagorean numbers always contained such wisdom, and zero always represented this skin. With zero, 
we come out of the physical world into the spiritual world. There is nothing within this zero that is of value for the spiritual world. When advanced esotericists lose consciousness, or when their limbs become stiff, they should place the rose cross before their souls, the symbol of, quote, die and become, close quote. Advanced pupils, pupils who are already seeing in a certain way, have greater temptations and attacks than those who are just beginning. Many kinds of ugly forms appear to them which want to distract them. Indeed, also deceptive images in venerable form who want to say to them, quote, All this I will give you. Close quote. And if they do not resist these temptations, they can come into great danger. Here too the rose cross, the black wood of the cross with the red roses, that represent the blood flowing down from the wounds of the Redeemer on Golgotha, is the safest means to resist this temptation. No matter what their experiences may otherwise be in thousands of variations, there is one experience that all esotericists have, if only they have patience and endure, then it will one day also come to them, namely the feeling of being divided into pieces, of being partitioned into various streams. We know that on Saturn the thrones, on the sun the spirits of wisdom, on the moon the spirits of movement, on the earth the spirits of form, guided our evolution. On Saturn the thrones guided our blood. On the sun the spirits of wisdom guided our glandular system. On the moon the spirits of movement guided our nervous system. Now the pupil feels him or herself as if divided up between all these streams. However, there exists then the danger of losing oneself entirely and not finding the way back. And here it is also necessary to imagine the Rose Cross. Through proper immersion and meditation, a feeling of safety, calm and peace then comes over the pupil. Not a peace that consists only of calmness, but a peace such as can only be found in higher worlds and would be achievable here if we could imagine it thus. A roaring, surging, storming sea whose substance is the same as if it lay there calm and smooth. If you were to stand in the middle of this surging, raging sea on a wreck and were able to forget yourself to the extent that you had no anxiety and fear of death for your personal life, but rather in the middle of this roaring and mortal danger could be immersed only in the lofty, magnificent view of the raging sea and felt only the beauty and loftiness of this view, then in this moment you would have peace as it can be found in the spiritual world. This peace is possible in the spiritual world. Here it is not possible, except when we can forget ourselves completely in ecstasy, when we open our souls so wide that the peace of all the spiritual world streams in. All names for Christ that are other than I am, are not correct. We can never speak of He. Mystical, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Masonic, Power, Effect, Being, Gnostic, in brackets not indicated, Alchemical, Sulfur, Mercury, Salt. The end of Record A. Record B. And finally, the pupil should hold firmly in his or her soul, constantly preserve the freedom and independence of the I, that is our highest being, and looking up to Christ, may there stand in our soul, Christ is the archetype of the I, may my I strive to become a reflection of this archetype. And this archetype cannot be characterized by any name other than I am. Everything that the masters, the leading spirits of humankind, have given from their experience of millennia in an esoteric training that has a right to exist, 
never touches this independence of the pupils who entrust themselves to them. The teachers will never give a pupil something from outside that is ever finished. Rather, everything they give is given to the free will of the pupil so that it can unfold its effectiveness in him or her. The becoming or growth is placed in the hands of the human being him or herself. The impulse is given into the I, and the I must develop it out of its own inner power that can only be enkindled from within. For this reason it is a kind of impurity if an esoteric teacher reveals his or her own feelings to a pupil. He or she conveys facts about the spiritual world. The pupils themselves develop their own feelings about them, and their souls blossom from it, just as flowers blossom from seeds. And on the pupil's esoteric path, there is a vow that is always alive in their souls, that they always keep awake in their souls. I will never injure another human being, neither through words nor through deeds, not even in thoughts. Here we must not allow ourselves any excuse. Here we must be as strict as possible with ourselves and as gentle as possible with others. Hate, too, must entirely disappear in us, not by suppressing it, for that would only bring about its transformation into fear. Fear is always suppressed hate, Hate must be transformed, not suppressed, and transformed hate is then love in our soul. Every kind of hate is destructive. Love, however, builds up. It creates in the human soul. The end of that esoteric lesson. The next esoteric lesson was given in Munich on March 8, 1909. Record A, manuscript is anonymous. Record B, Manuscript from Alice Kinkle. Record A. In today's lesson, we will have much to repeat of what we said the last time, January 7th. And at the same time, we will bring new material as well as illuminating much from another side. An esoteric lesson is for us a ladder, so to speak, to lead us upward through our meditations by again and again making clear, stressing and imprinting us with the mood with which the masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings have given us these meditations and with which we should perform them. We know that meditation is, in a small way, a weak reflection of an initiation, an initiation that we will all one day reach and go through we who have gone the esoteric path. Meditations come from the powers that want to bring evolution forward and that we usually refer to as the good powers. For certain reasons, opposing, hindering powers are woven into the world plan. They would like to stop evolution. Since we would like to advance ourselves faster through our meditations in order to foster the evolution of humankind, Meditation is precisely the field in which the hindering powers attempt to intervene in every way destructively. In beginners, by calling to memory the everyday events of the last days. In advanced seers, primarily by placing animals and seductive figures in their field of vision. These pictures which are like all beings of the physical plane, for example, one sees rats and mice, come from a sub-physical realm. The astral and devaconic worlds are higher than the physical, but there is also a sub-physical realm, and precisely from this realm the pictures sneak in for those meditants who have attained spiritual vision. The less the beings that we see are similar to those on the physical plane, the more they are similar to what we call sphinxes, seraphim and cherubim, the more certain we can be that we are seeing lofty, good beings and that we are on the right track with our meditations. In the last hour we already mentioned the remedy against the attacks mentioned, the caduceus, the staff of mercury 
wound round with two snakes. Every being that has life for itself is enclosed in a skin. There is no being without a skin. Thus not only our physical body but also our astral body has a skin. The skin has certain peculiarities. It has different strengths among different people with different characters. A dependent, willless person has a brittle, cracked astral body prone to tearing. Hence he or she has a tendency toward dependence and devotion and the frequent wish to dissolve into the universe. An independent person, gifted with a strong will, has a strong, powerful astral skin. With all people, however, this skin is used up in the course of the day, which means it gets holes, tears, is frayed, and in the sight of a clairvoyant hangs around the astral body. This tearing of the astral skin is the cause of the feeling of exhaustion, of drowsiness. When we fall asleep, the eye and the astral body separate from the body and etheric body and return to the womb of God, which wove the astral body. The astral body draws from God new forces to form a new skin. Now, it is of tremendous importance for us and for the progress we want to make that when we consciously enter into this very real process, that is, when falling asleep, that we say to ourselves that we are returning to the gods from whom we have come forth, who created us. For this reason, the moment of falling asleep should be holy. The snakes on the caduceus symbolize for us the new formation of the astral skin. The snake is known as an animal that sheds its skin, and the white snake is a symbol of young life arising anew in a new skin. With this symbol we are to make clear to ourselves that every morning our astral body arises with a new young skin. These symbols did not spring from speculation and are not given to us so that we can launch into speculations about them, but rather so that we let them live in our soul. We can imagine the Mercury staff before every meditation, evenings and mornings, and also use it during meditation in order to ward off the evil influences discussed. The last time we spoke about the fact that in the course of time the meditant, entirely in meditation, has a feeling of being split up, of dissolving into the universe, of being torn apart by everything that is connected with the physical, etheric, astral bodies, by all wishes, stimulations, distractions, etc., by everything that belongs to the moment, and that the feeling is correct, for it comes from our devotion in meditation to the powerful beings that created us. On Saturn, our physical body came into being when the thrones, so to speak, poured themselves out, gave themselves in devotion. Our physical body came into being through these emanations as a secretion of warmth that was organized within itself. On the sun, the spirits of wisdom gave themselves in devotion in order to create our etheric body, while new bands of thrones arranged organs in our physical body that we would one day use on the moon. On the moon, the spirits of movement joined and created our astral bodies, while again new groups of thrones and spirits of wisdom worked new organs into our physical and etheric bodies. Here on earth the spirits of form worked on our eye and we are giving ourselves in devotion to all these legions in meditation. We feel ourselves dissolving into them and are allowed to do this, but only in full consciousness. If we feel our consciousness diminishing or entirely lose it, then this is a sign that evil powers have intervened. And the more we give ourselves to this feeling of fainting, the more life forces they will take from us. 
Coming out of the meditation we are weakened instead of strengthened. Anyone who constantly goes through this unconsciousness can become ill and miserable, and the consequence is a feeling of ongoing fatigue and lack of interest in life. For the evil powers love humans who advance through meditation more than ordinary people and attach themselves more intensely to them in order to destroy them. Those who have advanced to spiritual vision and have achieved a state of complete absorption in meditation, they see all these heavenly kingdoms that created them They see how their physical body, their etheric body, their astral body disappear and are dissolved in these realms. And they must experience this with the intensive feeling, die and become, in full consciousness that their lower eye dies away in order to acquire a new consciousness in higher worlds. There is an obstacle for meditants that they can trip over the figure of a tempter who approaches them in order to whisper to them that these heavenly worlds are their own creation, that they can do as they like in them. However, those who surrender to this feeling, that even the smallest thing in these worlds belong to them as their own, they slip onto a false path. This temptation is magnificently described in the Bible in the temptation of Christ. And almost all meditants must go through this on a small scale. The symbol that helps us in this temptation is the rose cross, the black cross, the symbol of death, the seven red roses, the symbol of new germinating life from the blood flowing forth from the Savior. A wonderful legend says that when the Savior died, the bees came and sucked the pure chaste blood as they otherwise sucked on the red rose blossoms. In the deepest sense, the red roses are a symbol for the sacred blood of Christ. Evil powers must step back from those who place this black wooden cross with the seven blossoming dark red roses before their soul. For this reason, we should let it live in us after every meditation. It is a symbol from which we can draw boundless power. Those who overcome all these dangers, those who forget during meditation everything that belongs to their physical, etheric, and astral bodies, and immerse themselves only in the Godhead, will attain what is called peace of soul. But we must not imagine here the kind of comfortable peace that we know as bodily rest. Nothing bodily has anything to say in this case. We can form an idea of this peace of the soul only with a picture. Let us imagine the incredibly large surface of a sea, calm over a wide area. And then, let us imagine the same sea wildly surging, with breaking waves towering high above the raging surface. This will be difficult for modern humans in their present evolution. And let us imagine ourselves on a sinking ship in the midst of these surging waves, in the force of our approaching, inevitable death. In such moments to feel nothing, no terror, no dread of death, nothing but the wonderful beauty of the elements unleashed, the magnificence of creation, those who can do that know what peace of soul is. As often as possible we should let such pictures, such thoughts live in us in all their greatness and fullness. And we will feel how we are one with creation, how fear and terror or its elements and eruptions disappear. And we will draw strength from all hindrances that are placed against us in life. The end of record A. Record B. How one brings down from the spiritual world such formulas, such as those concerning the spirit of the day. By concentrating on the heart, one gets the formula for Sunday. What are we striving for in esotericism? We are striving for a connection of the I with the truth. 
Before we strove for esotericism, we had only a connection of the I with Maya, the sense world. Anything in us that does not fit into the spiritual world must be separated from us if we want to enter this spiritual world. That is brought about by beings of the Luciferic legions. Their names are Samael, Azazel, Azael, Mahazael. The end of record B and the end of that esoteric lesson. The next esoteric lesson was given in Hamburg on March 14, 1909. Record A notes from JB, question mark. Record B notes from Amelie Wagner. Record A. Every exercise is a reflection, no matter how small, of a picture of initiation. And the humble feeling that we bring to initiation we should place in every meditation given to us. It is important not only that we do every exercise precisely and regularly, but most of all how we do each exercise. There can be hundreds of different experiences of meditation, but certain typical experiences everyone must go through. All beginners have to battle with aramonic beings that penetrate their consciousness during meditation and attempt to distract them. This becomes noticeable as a stream. In order to understand this, we must be clear about the following. All independent life is surrounded by a skin, and so is the astral body. This enclosed astral body was always signified by a zero. Foreign beings cannot penetrate into a being enclosed by a skin. Thus, the human astral body was a zero, a nothing for the remaining beings. By being separated out from the entire astral material, and surrounded by a skin, the astral body becomes a one, and that is signified by setting the one before the zero, one zero. To this are then added the numbers that point to future stages of evolution on Jupiter and Venus, six five, excuse me, six and five. Thus emerges the mystic number one zero six five, Dizan which is spoken of entitled The Secret Doctrine by Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. During the day, the astral body is worn out by the impressions that it receives from outside. In this way, the skin gets tears so that forces can stream out, forces necessary for the physical body. At night, the astral body goes into astral regions, And when it again enters the human being in the morning, the human being feels strengthened because the astral body has been healed again. This is given to our consciousness without any action on our part. And with this thought, holy feelings full of humility should permeate us. There is a remedy that will hinder our amonic beings from penetrating into our consciousness a symbol that one must enliven within oneself. This is the staff of Mercury, the luminous staff with a black snake and a brightly luminous shining snake. The snake is a symbol for the astral body. Every night the astral body sheds its skin. It throws off the used-up skin. The black snake is a symbol for this. Overnight it gets a new shimmering skin. And this newly enlivened, beautiful, shining skin of the astral body is symbolized by the shining snake. When we let it rise up before us, before every meditation, this symbol, the staff of Mercury, which the messenger of the gods holds in his hand, who shows the way, bans everything that wants to push into our consciousness and disturb. When we ascend higher, when we become clairvoyant, our amonic beings advance on us in pictures. We see parasitic animals, rats and mice. As a temptation, beings approach us with beautiful human faces but crippled feet. We must not give ourselves to them. Good pictures are when the meditant sees a sphinx, seraphim or a cherubim. Here, too, 
the staff of Mercury is to be used to ban the beings that would pull us down. When the meditant ascends higher, he or she has the feeling with new exercises of being divided up, of flowing apart. This feeling is entirely justified. The human being here is the torn apart Dionysus. Yet his or her consciousness must not be allowed to be lost here. In order to understand this, we point out the following. On Saturn, the thrones, the lofty sublime beings, worked on the physical body. The physical body does not belong to us. It is an optical illusion. Currents that go forth from the lofty thrones form it. Think of creeks that flow together. Where they meet, a whirlpool comes into existence. Thus physical existence comes into being where the currents streaming forth from the thrones meet together. The physical body is something lofty, godly, upon which the thrones are still working. The etheric body was formed by the beings of wisdom on the sun. On the moon the beings of movement worked on the astral body. On the earth the beings of form worked on the eye. Thus the feeling of flowing apart is entirely justified. We feel ourselves being given back to the streams that formed us. However, lower beings attempt here to extinguish the consciousness of meditants, and that must not be allowed to happen. In order to prevent this from happening, every time we notice that our consciousness wants to disappear, we place before our soul the rose cross. It is also very good to immerse ourselves in it at the end of every exercise. Before every exercise, the staff of Mercury after the exercise, the rose cross. In the black cross we imagine the lower aspect, the animal nature in the human being that must be overcome. Out of this nature the seven sprouting red roses must blossom. A beautiful legend relates that when Christ was hanging on the cross with his bleeding wounds, bees came and drew honey from them as they otherwise did from red roses. Through his sacrifice, his blood had changed its chemical constituents. It was as pure as the fluid of the red rose. Yet a step higher is when we consciously find ourselves in the higher spheres. We feel ourselves there not as an I, but entirely selfless. Then the following temptation approaches. The devil shows us the world which then reveals a certain splendor. The devil says, Behold, there lies the world. It is to be yours if you attach yourself to me. But everything personal must be extinguished here. And at this moment we find our eye consciously lighting up. In order to withstand the temptation of the devil, one should meditate on the rose cross. When we have consciously found ourselves again in meditation, we feel the region of soul peace. But this region does not only contain peace, also in it the battle of the gods is raging. Thunder is roaring of which our earthly battles are only a weak reflection. It is a peace during battle, as both calm and storms rule in the same substance in water. The following is hardly possible for modern day humankind, but if it were possible, then it would be a picture of what was just described to stand on a sinking ship with the awareness that you will enter physical death in the next minutes, and blissfully to expect death enchanted by the beauty of raging nature. Thus the meditant rests in blessed peace, in the region of soul peace, aware of the storm and battle in the same region. A great hindrance for meditants is hatred, which lacerates the astral body and stimulates decay and causes vibrations of death in the physical body. We are just as responsible for unintentional injury as for intentional injury. If hate is merely suppressed, then its vibrations are rearranged into fear. People who have fear can never be genuine esotericists because they still have suppressed hate within them. 
We should try to prevent unintentional insults. It, must, it is much easier to have good intentions than to act wisely. We must acquire love of wisdom in order to transform the hate. This love of wisdom flows out of the theosophical worldview. The end of Record A. Record B, an excerpt. When meditants manage to penetrate into the realm of spirits, then their astral body expands. They have left their sheath behind, and they have the feeling that they have been divided up. They no longer feel themselves as separate beings. They have forgotten their personal earthly names. Thus it should be. This is worth achieving. But there is a danger associated with it. When meditants then lose their consciousness and faint, fall into a trance, then they are weakened. They are then exposed to the influences of mediums which injure them. If they feel this condition approaching, they should place the rose cross, the rosy cross, before the eye of their soul, EYE, at first in imagination. Later, they will see it in reality. That maintains them in waking consciousness. There is a wonderful legend that when Jesus' side was opened and blood flowed forth, bees came and drew honey from it. What they obtained from chaste flowers, from roses, they could draw from the pure blood of the dead Christ. Finally, Dr. Steiner spoke of soul peace, comparable to the flat surface of the sea, yet the same water that reflects so quietly and peacefully can be stirred up into high crashing waves. So too is the spiritual world. Terrible battles are fought there. Compared to the battles of the gods, all the battles here on earth are child's play, a weak reflection. Is it possible to preserve their peace of soul? It is possible, and indeed as it is hardly possible here on the earth. But we can explain it with a comparison. Think of a person on the high seas. Waves upon waves mount up, crashing upon and breaking the masts. The ship is the victim of the waves. Bodily death is imminent. Death is certain, and the person is so taken by the majesty of nature's power, by the impressive drama, that he or she forgets him or herself and goes down with these lofty, reverent feelings. If we can do this, and we will achieve it on the spiritual plane sooner or later, then we have experienced, quote, die and become. Close quote. That's the end of that esoteric lesson. The next esoteric lesson was given in Berlin on March 21st, 1909. Record A notes from Paula Stritzik. Record B notes from Wilhelm Hüberschleiden. Record A. This is the last esoteric lesson for a few weeks. It is my obligation to give you some instruction for this time. Only those who still have very important questions can ask them of me after this lesson. It is good when esotericists become accustomed to being independent. If they cannot answer a question for themselves, then they should pose it again and again, but without brooding. The answer will come to them soon enough. Patience and endurance are the main factors for an earnestly striving esotericist. Already in the last lesson, advice was given concerning the staff of snakes and the rose cross, which will take years to digest. What is to be presented today should be understood only as notes and remarks. The human being is an extraordinarily complicated creature. When someone begins to live as a vegetarian, there are many things to be considered. With everything that we consume, animal, plant, mineral, we take into us the spiritual forces that formed it. If, for example, we eat a bull, cow, cattle, then the forces are drawn into us that worked on that being back when the bull fell out of the series of advancing beings. Animals are beings who descended before their time, in which the forces hardened, the forces that were at work on them at the time of their turning aside from the evolutionary process. Animals have remained at the stage of evolution of that time. Thus, at the time when the bull fell out, 
The forces worked in such a way that a small brain and a protruding snout were formed. Those who consume bulls, that is beef, take into themselves these forces, which bring forth a small brain and a protruding snout. This is not to be understood in such a way that one physically becomes similar to a bull, that one gets a protruding snout and so forth, but rather one takes these forces into one's astral body, which then work to harden in this way. After death, when the astral body becomes free, it takes on these forms. One can observe this on the astral plane. This fact is the basis for the idea of, quote, transmigration of souls, close quote. However, the human being of today needs this hardening that comes to him or her through consuming flesh. Humankind was intentionally led to eating animals at a certain time. In those beings that did not fall out of the entire process, in whom the form, at the moment of falling out of the process, was not hardened, the forms remained softer so that other forces could continue to work on them and develop them to higher stages. If humans had not eaten any animals, then they would have remained soft. They would have assumed grotesque forms instead of the present-day human countenance. Now, if people today live as vegetarians, then they lose this hardening influence, this inner solidity. And if they do not have a healthy body through heredity, if they are not, as we say, a robust person, then they can easily lose their inner stability and can even become insane. Esotericists must overcome the fact that something outside them is working for their progress. They must take their own development into their own hands and aim at acquiring this solidity that was brought to them through these hardening forces by means of acquiring clear thinking. Through thinking and immersing oneself in the states of old Saturn, Sun, Moon, and so forth, which has been told to us again and again through living in purely impersonal thoughts, the esotericist creates firm lines in him or herself and avoids the danger of vacillation and being scattered. We should not allow our thinking to be influenced by prejudices of any kind, by habits and relationships connected to the family, to one's country, race, age, and so forth. Our thinking should be free, entirely free. Everything taught in theosophy can be understood with healthy common sense. When we know that a copy of the astral body of Jesus of Nazareth was reincarnated in Francis of Assisi, we then understand his entire life and work. The way modern life is, esotericists cannot avoid situations in which they must act unjustly. Here we must always bear in mind that the magnificent law of karma is at work, compensating always and everywhere. We must develop our intelligence. There are adults who have the intelligence of a twelve-year-old, indeed an eight-year-old. While the body continued to grow, the intelligence remained at a certain stage. Such people can perform the duties of the office in which they are placed without their lack of intelligence being noticed. In such offices, everything down to the smallest detail is prescribed from above. They need only adhere to these regulations. But if they leave this office, then they lose the stability of these regulations, and very soon they collapse. Another danger for esotericists consists in this, that when they have had any kind of special experience, they consider themselves very devout and selfless. If we look more closely, we would notice that nevertheless, behind this an egotism is found, even if in a very subtle form and therefore difficult to recognize. This subtle egotism must also be overcome if one really wants to let Christ be born within. And we can overcome it only through pure thinking. If we have seen something astral or the like, 
then we should be clear about what it is and not imagine that it has great significance and, and proves that we are already evolved to know, excuse me, to who knows what heights. We should approach everything very clearly and impersonally. We should purify our thinking, feeling and willing in order to allow the spirit to work through them. End of record A. Record B. It is questionable whether these notes really reproduce the lessons of March 21, 1909, because the other notes contain a different content. With respect to the drawing on page 401, which is not explained here, see Rudolf Steiner's lecture of December 28, 1907, in titled Myths and Legends, Occult Signs and Symbols, Collected Works, Volume 101. Caduceus and Rose Cross to be studied thoroughly, meditatively. Inner experiences also create selfishness and vanity. These are to be overcome only through pure thinking. Esoteric sentences must be meditated upon in such a way that they completely fill us inwardly. We must devote ourselves to a sentence with all our forces of soul. All such sentences point to an outer form. This we should imagine. Thus our own being forms itself further. By spiritually living into and immersing ourselves in such a sentence and such a form, we begin to feel the power within us that until now has formed our own being. This is the creative power of the soul that forms the body out of the soul. This is this in particular with the I am. In doing so, one is to feel, quote, I rejoice that I can co-work in the world as a being with initiative. I want to place myself in the context of the whole world. If we concentrate this, in, close quote, if we concentrate this in a single act of consciousness and also direct the power of our consciousness toward the hypothesis, transfer it there, then we are transferring ourselves thus into a higher world, into the world of creative power. A living thought comes to us. Just as my thought is alive, so too the force that lives in and drives the plant seed must be inwardly alive. Soon this thought becomes for us a raying out of light. A joyful enthusiasm and love for creative existence will soon fill us. A power is imparted to our will that fills it with warmth and makes it energetic. In this way, intellectual, ethical, and soul forces of the highest kind are born in us. We enter more and more into a conscious relationship to the higher spiritual world. That's the end of Record B. There is then a chart. Above it says, World Thought, It Thinks, Moon Evolution. World Soul, She Feels, Sun Evolution. World will, he wills, Saturn evolution. Then there's a caduceus with various labelings on it. That's the end of that esoteric lesson. The next esoteric lesson was given in Dusseldorf on April 15, 1909. Record A, manuscript from Matilda Scholl and Anonymous. Record B, manuscript from Alice Kinkle. Record A. As with every esoteric lesson, today we want to remind ourselves that what is imparted to us in this hour comes from the masters of wisdom and the harmony of feelings. We want to develop ourselves, not out of an egotistical longing for development, but rather in order to become helpers of humanity, with whom our karma is connected. We should emerge from this hour as different people from those who we were when we entered, as we benefit from the instruction for our daily esoteric work. The main point, which cannot be impressed upon us too often, is that we fill these most intimate undertakings of the soul with the proper attitude. In the first instance, our meditations take into consideration the division of the human being into sleeping and waking consciousness. They are given to us from primeval, pre-Atlantean consciousness. They are given to us from this bisection 
of the human being. Why is it necessary that humans at night withdraw their eye and astral body out of the physical and etheric bodies? The divine beings that created and formed the physical and etheric bodies into such a majestic and perfect temple supply them again during the night while the eye and the astral body also entered divine realms. If they did not do this, they would completely ruin their physical and etheric bodies, because aside from the divine spiritual beings, who were their creators, luciferic beings also have influence on the astral body. For these were the beings who made the astral body free and independent. In this way, humans fall back into error and guilt during the day when they return to their physical bodies. It is not the physical and the etheric bodies that are subject to errors, but rather the astral body that is seduced by the eye and gives in to the promptings of luciferic beings. Normal people are protected from the deeper, more dangerous influences of these luciferic beings by a strong power given them by the divine spiritual creators. But an esotericist must use this power in order to ascend to higher stages of evolution. When falling asleep, esotericists should say to themselves, quote, I am returning to my creator, close quote. And when awakening, quote, I am coming to the place where I abided before my body was created, close quote. And in meditation, they should abide for a few moments consciously in these realms. If they practice with this attitude, they will thereby enkindle the holy fire, the inner warmth within themselves that is necessary for them. And in the evening, before falling asleep, they should develop the same feeling during their esoteric work, even if it is only the daily retrospection. By allowing their day to pass before them backward, from its end to its beginning, they create spiritual pictures that they take as an extract into the spiritual world. This must happen backward toward the beginning of the day, because in the spiritual world everything happens this way, and we thereby create a transition into it so that it flows into us more easily, so that we can enter it more easily. By carrying ordinary forward-directed thinking into the spiritual world, we push against it, shove it away from us, and in this way we ourselves hinder our development. As in the night luciferic beings influence us, so to speak, from within, so during the day are harmonic Mephistophelian from outside. What have these beings caused in humans through this influence? Along with freedom and eye-consciousness, luciferic beings brought their most extreme form, hatred. Humans would never have been able to hate had they not increasingly felt separated in their eye. And Aramonic beings enveloped the divine spiritual beings in the smoke of Maya for human eyes, so that humans no longer see what stands behind things, that's E-Y-E-S. Thus fear comes into being. Humans would never have known fear if they could see the divine creator instead of bumping against the things in space. Small children learn fear in the moment when they come into contact with matter, when they bump against it. Esotericists must learn to set aside these two, hate and fear, even in their most subtle shadings, in order to advance forward with success. Zoroaster, one of our most powerful teachers, has for this reason left words behind that should serve us in achieving fearlessness. If we understand these words properly, he said, I will speak, now come and listen to me, you who have a longing from near and far. I will speak of him who can be revealed to the mind, and no longer shall the deceptive senses confuse people which instigated so much evil in human evolution. I will speak of that 
which is to me the first and the greatest of what he has revealed to me, the great spirit who is Ahura Mazda. Those who do not hear my words as I understand and intend them will experience evil when the earth's course comes to an end in his age. Close quote. With these words, he wanted to instruct people that the external sun, S-U-N, is only a sheath for the great ruler of the spirits of fire, just as every physical thing is a sheath for something spiritual. And if we concentrate on this great Ahura Mazda, which stands behind the life-giving sun, then fearlessness will come to us. And much later, the great Zoroaster put forward another symbol for overcoming hatred. He had two pupils. For one, he prepared an astral body so that he became clairvoyant. And for this reason, this pupil could, in another incarnation, with his prepared astral body, unite together with that of Zoroaster, who had sacrificed his for this purpose. This pupil became the great Hermes, who guided the Egyptian mysteries. Zoroaster sacrificed his etheric body to the second pupil, whose etheric body was also carefully prepared for this union. This pupil was reincarnated as Moses. That he received a special etheric body we can understand from the story in the Bible about the basket boat, in which he had to abide for a while as a small child, closed off from the world so that his eye and astral body would not be influenced in a confusing way by subtle processes caused by outer impressions. The eye of Zoroaster was powerful and strong enough to create for itself new etheric and astral bodies for a new incarnation. After he was Nazarathos, the teacher of Pythagoras, he finally became Jesus of Nazareth, who could then sacrifice his three bodies, also the physical for Ahura Mazda, whom he had always proclaimed. Ahura Mazda now descended and lived in him, and for this reason Jesus could say, quote, I am the light of the world, in, close quote, in John's Gospel. And the symbol for the utter lack of hatred that Zoroaster left us in this way is the blood that flowed on Golgotha. Hatred is the most extreme expression of the eye. And what does our eye live in? In the blood. Our physical blood is even changed when this hardening, this wooden quality of the eye, this hatred, is transformed into the utter lack of hatred and this then into love. If chemists had correspondingly accurate instruments, they would be able to discover, for example, the difference in the blood between an ancient Indian and a Francis of Assisi. This spiritualization is also expressed in the physical realm. With the blood that flowed on Golgotha for humankind, we have a symbol for the complete lack of hatred with which we can transform every feeling of hatred into love in order to bring it before the altar of creative beings. The magical breath that goes forth from Golgotha has a transforming effect on hatred and fear, which are brothers just as the Luciferic beings and the Aramonic Mephistophelian beings are brothers. End of Record A. Record B. Hate is an utmost expression of Luciferic beings over and against the divine spiritual beings of love. With hatred, the eye is too strong. It is hardened in itself. Fear comes from Araman in Mephistopheles. Zoroaster wanted to educate humanity to fearlessness and a complete lack of hatred. For this reason, he first directed his words to Ahura Mazda. Quote, I will speak of that which is the highest to me, etc. Close parenthesis. And the second means for this education is the great mystery of Golgotha. The symbol for this ideal of fearlessness and complete lack of hatred is the blood that flowed from the wounds of the Redeemer, the blood that here represents the expression of the I capital in the physical realm. Retrospection is to be done in the evening before falling asleep. Those who do not do retrospection backwards and who as esotericists do not do retrospection at all 
are pushing back and restraining the spiritual world. An esotericist is permitted to ask, where do I come from? And the answer is permitted to be from the womb of divine spiritual beings, my creators. And where am I going? Back there, into their womb. We should consciously feel the moments of falling asleep and waking up to be sacred moments. Our physical body and our etheric body have come to us from divine spiritual worlds, from divine spiritual beings. For this reason we should not regard them with arrogance and condescension, but rather with holy reverence. Because the astral body is receptive to the promptings of Lucifer and Araman, it is important to always be awake. Lucifer gives us independence, but we also thank him for the possibility of error and evil. Araman envelops us in fear. Therefore we again and again despoil these bodies between waking and sleeping. That is the end of this first section of the Esoteric Lessons of 1909 by Rudolf Steiner.